Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show. This week we are talking all things interest rates, why they move, the impact they have on assets, and most importantly, how you can profit from it. Make sure you take plenty of notes, but as always, make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money and Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my co-host and offsider, Mitchell Laurential. Good to be here, Mr. B. Thank you very much for having me. Now, looking forward to your expertise today because talk of the town, we know the last sort of 18 months, even two years, has been interest rates. Mm. And a lot of uh, property holders out there grappling with those, also in the share market, big impacts. We want to understand the impact on the various asset classes of interest rates. Look, interest rates are a key metric. And I suppose if you take a step back, what are they and what are they used for? The key thing, I think, with interest rates is it's used to regulate the money flow within an economy. So it's a way of turning up the money flow by making interest rates lower and more appealing for people to access money. The cost of holding that money is obviously much lower, which then gives them more money to spend or, or, or do what they see fit with. Equally, if you want to take money out of the economy and slow it down, you push interest rates higher, which slows that spending down and people then tend to repay debt and it takes money out of the economy. And that, if you put an economics term around it, is something that's called monetarist policy. Uh, very nice. Civil monetary policy and gotcha. it's designed very specifically as a tool for, for, for managing economic output. So, you know, who sets them? Central banks typically uh, do so. So in the UK, the Bank of England, here in Australia with the Reserve Bank of Australia. Uh, in the US, we've got the Federal Reserve. In Europe, we've got the European Central Bank, which is, I guess, a little different insofar as it's not a sovereign bank for one country. It's the, the central bank for the European Union region. And that sort of comes with its challenges because you've got different paced economies within Europe. So typically, if you look at the um, the Mediterranean countries, the southern European countries, typically higher inflation and smaller economies, probably with the exception of Italy, versus the sort of powerhouse juggernauts of Germany and France in northern uh, Europe, where you know they want lower interest rates and in the south, they need higher interest rates. So very, very hard to organize there. But uh, by and large, that's how interest rates are set. So when we talk of the risk-free rate in terms of the syntax of this, so we have the central bank, which mm. sets the risk-free rate, and that's the rate at which the banks would borrow money from the central bank to then on-lend to businesses and consumers. Correct, yeah. You could use whatever the, the, the base rate, uh, the prevailing interest rate, is as, as your risk-free rate of return uh, on a very simple basis. It's not strictly true, but from a, f f to keep this nice and simple, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a, a good way to gauge, okay, risk-free, what can I make on my money and cash at the bank would be be that equivalent. So typically, it's not a huge return because typically we don't see interest rates that high. Although, of course, you know, in Australia we saw them up in the high teens at one point in time. You know, for for pretty much certainly all of your life and much of mine, um, you know, they sort of hover between. You know, the, it's effectively been zero and, and maybe seven or eight percent is the sort of range that we've seen over the last sort of thirty or forty years. Now, interest rates go up and down. Before we get into asset classes, how they're affected, is it just based on inflation, or is there more to it? Look, interest rates are used as a tool to combat inflation, um, but they can also be used um, as, as a preemptive tool to, to, to stimulate an economy as well. And that's not strate strategically or necessarily directly about inflation. That might be, you know, if, you, if your economy is, is, is very sluggish, you've got high unemployment, business confidence isn't very high, by having lower interest rates, you're flooding uh, the economy with new money, which tends to be like putting kerosene or petrol on a fire and it's going to start flaring up and, uh, and doing doing more activity. And that's because consumers and businesses can borrow for cheaper, right? So exactly there's a greater right. incentive to so do so. So a business can borrow to build a new factory, uh, just very crudely. If you're in the construction space, the cost of capital is much lower. So building uh, costs reduce, make it more appealing to start construction, which then employs people, which then stimulates an economy. Got you. Well, look, let's get into the nitty gritty of this mm. episode. So different effects on different asset classes, mm. and this can get quite complicated. So let's start nice and easy. Let's start with our game, stocks. Mm. Interest rates going up, what kind of effect does that have on stock markets? Look, actually, depending on the type of business, actually can have quite a, a mixed impact. So generally speaking, if interest rates are moving up, the economy is stronger. That's when you expect to see that. And a stronger economy historically is good for stock markets. Um, and, and so as a first instance, higher interest rates, you can assume the stock market is generally performing quite well. Not always the case. If you've got companies that are burdened with very, very heavy levels of debt, yeah, infrastructure companies, for example, that higher cost of capital that they now have to pay takes money out of their operating cash flow to service to service more debt. So those sorts of businesses would typically struggle uh, if they're carrying higher levels of debt. But if you take an example of, say, the banks, well, 
higher interest rates uh, for the banks can be really boom times. Um, number one, obviously the economy is going well, that's why rates are moving up, so the banks are typically doing all right. But if, if interest rates are quite low, let's say they're at sort of 1.5%, which they were not so long back, and you're a bank, the difference between what you pay your savers and what you earn from people that borrow from you is actually relatively thin. If interest rates are 1.5%, you might be paying a saver 1.3%, and you might be on lending that money at, say, 2.5%, which obviously gives you a margin there of, say, 1.3%. But if interest rates are at 6 or 7%, you might be paying your savers 5 and lending at 8 So your margin has expanded really quite considerably. And there's room to expand that margin, which typically, uh, and I've exaggerated it a touch, but you get the idea, it tends to be more profitable for banks through higher interest rates because they've got the ability to push out their margins. It's funny you say that, yeah. just to just to butt in if I can. The CEO of Commonwealth, I think is Matt Coman, he Correct. actually made a statement maybe, say, six or eight months ago, said for every 25 basis points that interest rates go higher, CBA's margin on a loan increases by five basis points. Mm. So a really nice competitive advantage. Yep, so you're taking 20% of whatever that margin is and adding it to your bottom line. So obviously that works in reverse when interest rates are cut. That's coming off your bottom line. And yeah, Matt Coman's pretty solid CEO, probably one of the better ones in the marketplace. Indeed. Now, on the back of that, because the risk-free rate of return has, has increased, as an investor in the stock market, if you can earn 5% cash at the bank and a company pays a 4.5% dividend, that's not really that appealing because, number one, you're earning less from an income perspective and you've got what would be perceived as a significantly high level of risk investing in stocks versus holding cash at the bank. So to, I guess, maintain investor interest, putting it crudely, typically when interest rates move higher, you see the dividend yield on stocks increase where they pay more out in terms of dividend to investors to get that percentage, that dividend yield up, so it's, it's it still remains attractive in the marketplace. So you tend to earn more as a dividend uh, in that situation when, when rates are moving higher. Now, if interest rates do go up, AB, and that's designed to slow the economy down, uh, that would mean that companies may not necessarily be growing their earnings at the quickest pace mm -hmm. because also their borrowing costs have gone up as well. That mm -hmm. can have an inverse impact, right? Look, it certainly can. Um, you know, in that instance where you're trying to take money out of the economy and slow things down. Consumer um, uh, cyclical type stocks, you know, particularly uh, consumer discretionary clothing, things like that, can suffer on the back of it because the consumer has got less money to spend because they're busier paying a higher mortgage or, or there's more incentive to keep cash at the bank in terms of savings. So it can affect those sorts of businesses um, for sure. Um, I guess you know, there's a pace of things and the impact of a change in interest rates is very slow in terms of its direct and immediate impact on what's going on within an economy. So if you move interest rates up, there's a lag factor of you know, maybe three, four, five months before the real effect of that is felt. Yes, your mortgage payments might have gone up and uh, and you go, okay, that's okay for the first couple of months until you start to realise it's actually a sustained amount that needs to be paid and then people gradually slow their spending down. So it can be quite delayed in terms of its impact, which which I think for central banks makes it pretty damned hard because to, 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 to really manage interest rates because you're working off data that's probably be three months lagging and you're making a decision today and you're not going to see any impact on that decision or from it for about three months. So there's this enormous window of, I guess, intuition to say if we do this, it's likely to do that, but it hasn't yet, but it probably will and we've got to give it time. So it's not the easiest job in the world and you know, some central bankers I think definitely are, are better than <laughs> others. So I think Jerome Powell has been exceptional in he the has. US in terms of threading the needle, both in terms of of the US's interest rate policy to avoid a, 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 a slowdown in the economy, but getting inflation under control, they've done a marvellous job of that. But I think where he's really excelled is his ability to communicate what their intentions are. And I think that transparency has been one of the many reasons why the US economy and, and markets have really performed as strong as they have. And deliver on those intentions too. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, we, we can quickly mention this one. You've already done so already, but cash at the bank as mm. an asset class, interest yeah. rates go higher, you're getting paid more for your savings, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and this can be a little bit of a poison chalice for people in that if you're earning 5% at the bank uh, as compared to 3%, you feel significantly better off because your money appears to be working harder. But I think you've got to step back and ask yourself the question, why have interest rates moved higher? Oh, that's right, because there's inflation. So you've got to then discount what those earnings are basis inflation. So if inflation is at 5% and you're earning 6% interest, you're actually only earning 
a net 1% on a real basis. You've got to discount the inflation factor in there. So maybe cash at the bank isn't such a good place during times of inflation, even though interest rates have moved higher. So does that apply to term deposits as well? If we see interest rates go higher, term deposits would have to follow, right? They do. Uh, inflation is a tax on cash, effectively. So if you've locked yourself in for three years at 6%, um, you know, during times of rising inflation, that's going to be problematic for you. But as that inflation pressure peaks out and starts to roll back the other way, then your net return goes up. Uh, I think holding cash at the bank, it depends on your age and your attitude to risk and so on. So if you're transitioning into retirement, that requirement to want to hold more cash from a security perspective is quite appealing. If you're younger, you have to be in growth phase. You can't bunker down. You've got to have your money growing. Indeed. Let's switch gears now. Let's look at bonds. Mm. It's been an interesting space and there's a few different ways to actually play this, either yields or prices. Mm. Talk to us about how bonds work and how interest rates have an impact on them. So effectively, a bond is, is, is an IOU. So it, the government says, listen, give me 100 grand and I'll give you a bit of paper and I'll also give you 5% a year until five years time for argument's sake and then I'll give you 100 grand back. That's a, effectively in very simple terms how a, a bond can work. Now, that 5% is fixed at the start of the bond. So you're going to get what's called a coupon or 5% of the face value of that bond for, for, for its duration. So if it's 100 grand and the yield on it is five, or the coupon on it is 5%, you're going to get paid $5,000 a year. Fixed income. Okay, so it's going to be $5,000 a year fixed that you earn for the duration of that investment. No matter what years, happens, right? right? So if inflation, I beg your pardon, if interest rates move higher, to be appealing, rather like a, a stock with a dividend yield needs to move higher to compel investors to want to hold those stocks. Similarly, if interest rates move higher, bond yields need to move higher to look competitive. There's a challenge in there in that I just said that it's a fixed income investment. In other words, you're going to get $5,000 a year fixed. $5,000 a year is what you're going to get as income. So if interest rates move higher, that bond yield would need to move higher too. So the yield might need to go to 6% to make that bond look attractive. Now, if you're earning $5,000 and the yield is now at 6% to look more attractive, the only way to make that equation work is for the actual physical value of the bond to drop. So now it's worth 96 grand instead of 100 grand. So the bond price has dropped. You still get your $5,000 a year, but as a percentage, it's say 6 or 6.5%. It's a tricky little concept to kind of get your head around. But there's an inverse relationship between the price of a bond and its yield. So if its yield moves up, the price of the bond will drop and vice versa. So that means if you had a, a, a an agreement with a bond as such, that if you wanted to trade out of it or you're exit gonna, that agreement, you'd take a loss. You're going to take a loss. Or you hold it to maturity and you, and you get your $100,000 back. Gotcha. Mm. Yep. Interesting space. It is. And look, bond trading hasn't particularly been my thing, um, being more of an equities and equity derivative specialist. But, you know, one of my former colleagues, one of the most incredible bond traders on the planet, a guy called John Sharman. For, uh, John, John's retired now. He's just one of the great guys in life, one of the nicest people you meet over in London. Um, he, um, they, they were playing this space very, very heavily. And, and, and it is a a high skill space. A lot of people think, oh, bonds are pretty slow moving. And yes, they may be, but there's a very, very high skill factor in, in trading them effectively. And John was one of the one of the absolute rock stars in that very space, nice. that's for sure. And, and look, they play a very important role in a portfolio. If you're looking for fixed interest um, because you're retired and you want to have a, a, a fixed income over a period of time, then holding bonds can be quite good. But you've got to understand that if you get out of it early, you're going to wear a haircut. Got you. Last one I'd like to discuss here in the nitty gritty is real estate. Mm. So if you're a property owner, interest rates go up, what's the effect? Look, if you're a property owner and interest rates have gone up, they've probably gone up because the economy is performing well uh, and there's more money chasing fewer goods. So the house price of what you have is probably increased in value too. Happy days. Uh, which is fantastic. Um, the flip side is your holding cost is also increased if you happen to have debt on the property. So all of a sudden, um, the cost of servicing that has increased. So if it's your primary place of residence, that can be a little challenging because it's going to crimp on the household budget. If it's an investment property, and as you well know, being a, a fellow landlord, you can pass that on to your tenant each year as you do your rent review and say, hey, look, rent's going up to this and you've got a choice. You can either pay more rent or, or not. And so you've got the ability with an investment property, I think, to insulate yourself 
from that risk of higher interest rates and higher holding costs uh, versus a primary place of residence where you don't. The second thing is, of course, depending on how you're structured, that interest rate is potentially a tax deduction for you as well. So you've yes. got a bigger deduction on the way through. So, you know, it can be a good thing in property. When the balance goes too far uh, in that interest rates have jacked up either too quickly or to an unsustainably high level where it's really caused pain, you can then see some weakness in the property market. But typically, it's not just interest rates that cause that. It's also some structural issues within property too, supply and demand of stock coming in and out of the market and so on. Um, also, when you look at the the makeup of borrowers, that can also be quite interesting because obviously, we're here in Australia, we've got a map of the world based on where we live and how our economy operates. But it's not the same everywhere. And I think one of the really interesting things to see uh, through this current interest rate cycle where we've seen interest rates move higher is the way it's impacted on different economies. So here in Australia, most people would be on a variable rate or you might have maybe a two-year fixed rate or three-year fixed rate perhaps. And when that fixed is over, you move on to a variable rate. And that was quite painful. We talked about the mortgage cliff, I think, several years ago and we talked about it last year too yeah. where there's this huge... Um, number of people that are moving off honeymoon type loans at low interest rates that are then having to pay six, seven, eight hundred dollars uh, a week more than what they were perhaps paying previously. And that's very painful. The US is quite different. And one of the big lessons I think the US uh, took out of the GFC back in 2007, 2008, obviously, you know, the GFC was orientated around a, a lot of what happened in the property market with mortgage backed securities. And so on reflection, they realized that the lending practices, I'll choose my words carefully here, were a bit cavalier. Terrible would be another way of describing it. And so there was a big shift in the US that buyers started to move into a very long-term fixed loan, and particularly when interest rates were much lower. So you'd have people on a 30-year fixed loan at 2%. That's crazy. Now, the wonderful thing about that is you know what your mortgage is going to be for the next 30 years. Better yet. If inflation comes along, which it has, on a real basis, what you're paying is getting less and less because the time value of money discounts by more when you have inflation. So it's a, a brilliant way to protect yourself from risk uh, and and understand what your monthly payments are going to be from a budgeting perspective. And, and it's been tremendously successful there. It slowed down the property market, not insofar as prices were dropping, but the the, the fact that people didn't want to move because you had to move from a 30-year fixed rate that you set at 2% to a 30-year fixed rate that was at current rates of, say, 4 or 5% made it expensive to move, so people backed away from that. But it insulated U.S. homeowners, I think, uh, from a lot of the pressure that we've seen here in Australia. Why didn't we do that? Well, I don't really feel that Australia got the full brunt of the GFC, and I remember trading through it. It was one of the most lucrative times uh, from, a, from a trading perspective. Because our economy didn't really slow down. We weren't that negatively impacted because it was around the same time that our relationship with China and particularly the resources boom kind of took over in the cycle and, and, and wallpapered over the cracks of the GFC. So we failed to learn that valuable lesson that the US did. But maybe this time around we might learn something there. Hopefully. Hopefully. Question for you, AB, mm. as we come to the end of our podcast here today. So, look, predicting interest rate movements is really tough. So the, do you have any strategies, first and foremost, for predicting interest rate movements, up or down? Usually my tea leaves. But, tea uh, leaves? <laughs> no, I think in, interest rates uh, move in, in decent trends. Uh, central banks don't go up one month, cut the next. You know, so what you're looking at is a trend. The hardest thing, I think, as an investor is when does that trend start? And I think just to take pressure off of people, you're never going to get the low, you're never going to get the high unless it happens to be pure luck. And so if you move that off the board as what your goal or intention is, is to get in at the ding dong low or the ding dong high um, and instead say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a change in trend. So we've gone through a cycle now um, across the Western world where we've seen interest rates moving up. And I think we're at the back end of that cycle now where it's a question of, yeah, they're probably not going to go up anymore. The next move is going to be down, but when does that trend start? So you're never going to get your timing spot on, but you know that the move up has ceased. So you can start to position yourself and you have to be patient in order to do that, to wait for that trend to then change. And that trend will then be locked in for quite a period of time because, again, central banks aren't going to go cut, 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 cut each month until rates are 0.1%. They're not going to do that because they like to see the impact of their decision making. So you tend to have, you know, 12, 18 month cycles when you have changes in, in rates either up or down to see the impact of that. So there's plenty of time 
to not get in on the B of the bang and to be able to get into it as that trend commences. That said, um, like if we, 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 we probably, like everybody at the start of the year, we're expecting to see interest rate cuts in the US and, and they've been gradually pushed back because the economic data has been a little bit stronger. I, I don't think we'll see a cut here in Australia. I was on the TV yesterday saying exactly the same thing. Um, you know, I don't think we'll see an interest rate cut here in Australia this year because our inflation situation is, is rather different from the US. Um, we've got other challenges too. Um, so how do you play it? My go-to instruments, say if we talk about the US, you, you can go, okay, cycle of rate tightening, interest rates going up, or cycle of cuts, uh, and they're the two things to really think about. And, and during a time of interest rates moving higher, well, as we've already explained, and I know it's a little murky getting into that world of, of bonds, when interest rates move up, bond prices drop. And my go-to investment is something like TBT, which is the ultra uh, is the short US 20-year treasury. In other words, when interest rates are rising, bond yields are going up, so TBT goes up in value. Got you. And TBT is an ETF. It's an exchange-traded fund on, yep. on, on 20-year treasuries in the US. Yep. The other side of the coin is that during a rate cutting cycle, bond prices are going to be going up because yields will be dropping. And the 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 yin and yang, if you will, of TBT is another ETF called TLT which is the long treasury as opposed to the short treasury. So they're very, very nice. crudely ways of going, look, I'm not going to be on the B of the bang, but those things will move in a nice trend over a reasonably sustained period of time when that happens. Now, of course, can be a little bit pedestrian trading that. So if you sort of open the drawer, the black drawer of don't open this unless you know what you're doing kind of thing, um, gearing up and getting a geared exposure, that is actually where I, I genuinely play. So things like TMF is a triple geared version of TLT. Perfect. So when we start to see that trend start where rates are starting to get cut, TMF will really take off because it's it's on steroids, it's triple geared. That's not for everybody. It'll clear your nostrils out if you get on the wrong side of it, for sure. Uh, and again, you can't be too fussy with your timing. It's going to happen. You're never going to get in on the ding dong low. So you've got to accept the fact that you might be holding that for a period of time or you might miss a little bit of the trend. But that trend will then be sustained when it happens, which is very, very typical for interest rates. Very nice. Well, there's a couple of good instruments for interest rates going up mm. or down and utilizing the trend following system, as you say, AB. Mm. Very nice. I think that's a really good analysis on interest rates and their impacts on investments. Any final words for our listeners? Look, I, I think... These, these are big macroeconomic indicators. And a lot of people, when you start talking about fundamentals or macroeconomics, they kind of glaze over. We've talked about them before uh, and go, oh, I just don't understand it. Or I'm not interested in that. The key thing to understand is they just go through cycles. They are either getting tightened or loosened. If they're getting tightened, then bond prices are going to drop and yields are going to increase. And if they're getting loosened, bond prices are going to go up and yields are going to go down. Now you know that they're the two things that happen. You can set your stall out to be able to capitalize on that and, and take a slice. How much of that slice is up to you? You might triple gear and say, hey, I want all of it. I'm getting in early. I'm riding this out. I'm wringing the last drops of moisture out of the dishcloth. I'm taking everything, which is a bit of an unrealistic expectation to put on yourself. Or you might just try and take the easy slab out of the middle. Either way, it's there for the taking. And now you know how to profit from it. Very nice. Thank you very much, AB. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button, and we'll look forward to chatting with you next week.